Hey folks, Wally Diem here, and today we're going to take a look at a character build for my favorite subclass, the Shadow Sorcerer. Now we're going to be building around the theme of the Frightened Condition, so we're going to be looking at a bunch of different abilities and spells that are going to be able to induce fear, and we're also going to tie that in with our Hound of Ill Omen. Now that is a sorcerer ability we get at level 6. We'll talk about that more when we get to that level, but we're going to be able to just combine these for a little bit of a combo, if you will, with regards to our Hound of Ill Omen and some of our abilities. Now we do need to multi-class for this character build, so we are going to take a level or two into Warlock. In fact, that's how we're going to build our character and start it out today. We're going to take Warlock level 1. And then after that, we're going to go 6 levels of Shadow Sorcerer and then back to Warlock. So I'm very excited to bring this build to you and I hope you enjoy it. Be sure to leave a comment below. But let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to my awesome R Sorcerer by the name of Onyx. So we are going to be using D&D Beyond to build our character today. And again, this is Onyx. He is an Asimar and will eventually be a Shadow Sorcerer, even though we're going to start off with a Warlock level 1. Now, I played the numbers a lot as to trying to start off with Sorcerer, and I found that this was the best way to do so. And I'll get into a little bit more of that here in just a bit. But let's start with our point by system, I was able to put a 15 into Charisma, and then I used the optional rules in Tasha's Cauldron and everything to be able to put that plus two and that plus one modifier wherever I see fit. So I put that in Charisma. That'll give us a Charisma 17, and at fourth level, we'll take a feat to get that up to 18. The other 14 I put into Constitution, and that is going to give us 10 hit points at level 1. A couple extra hit points than we would have as a Sorcerer. I then put the 13 into Dexterity and use that plus 1 modifier to put that up to 14. And that is going to give us an Armor class of 14. And with regards to the equipment, I took the Gold Buy so I could get Studded Leather Armor at level 1. And an Armor class of 14 is going to be about as good as it gets for this character without the the aid of magical items. The rest of the abilities kind of just fell into place. A 12 in wisdom, 10 in intelligence, and an 8 strength. Now I did take the criminal background, so a combination of our warlock class where we get two skill proficiencies, plus our criminal spy background is going to give us proficiency in deception, intimidation, stealth, and acrobatics. I really find that all of these pertain well to the shadow sorcerer, and any character that I build, I want to have either acrobatics or athletics, and since our strength isn't that high, acrobatics was definitely the right choice for us. Now, I did choose an Asimar, and I'd like to go over a few of the reasons why we're going to go that route. Now, there are plenty of other races that I feel would fit for this creature, but again, I'm going for that fear theme, and this one's going to fall right into it. Now, as far as languages are concerned, being an Asmar, we get Celestial in addition to Common. We are going to be a size medium with a 30 feet walking distance. And we also have an ability called Celestial Resistance. So you have resistance to necrotic and radiant damage. So that's really good starting off at level one, especially the necrotic damage. We're going to have Dark Vision out to 60 feet. And then once we become a Shadow Forcer, that's going to be pushed out to 120 feet. So this ability is a little bit redundant once we get going with our build. Now we do get the Healing Hands ability, which is really cool because this will be our only source of healing. And with Healing Hands as an action, we can touch a creature and roll a number of D4s equal to our proficiency bonus. So at level one, that'll be two D4. And the creature is going to regain a number of hit points equal to the total rolled. And we can use this once per day. So that'll be nice if we get in a pinch and we have to become the healers. We have one use of this and hopefully be able to help our party out. We also have the Light Bearer ability, which is going to be giving us the Light Cantrip. Now, I did say that I picked the Asamar to help reach those fear overtones, but that's an ability we won't get to third level, and we'll talk about that more when we reach that point. So let's jump into Warlock, and I did go with the Undead Warlock. I'm probably thinking maybe some type of a Lich or a powerful Ghost or someone like that will be our patron. Be sure to leave a comment below. Let me know what patron that you would pick for this character build. I'll probably homebrew something myself and put it on my website, wallydm.com, if you'd like to take a look. I'll put a link in the description below. 
Now with the Undead Warlock, we get a first level ability called the Form of Dread. You manifest an aspect of your patron's dreadful power. As a bonus action, you transform for one minute. You gain the following benefits. We're going to gain temporary hit points equal to a D10 plus our Warlock level. So that's a minimum of two. Once during each of your turns, when you hit a creature with an attack roll, you can force it to make a wisdom saving throw. And if the saving throw fails, the target is frightened of you until the end of your next turn. So already you can see where we're going with a fear theme. And what's going to be nice about this, and we're going to talk about this in a second, is our cantrip Eldritch Blast. We get more attacks as we reach fifth level and beyond. So if we miss on that first attack, we can still have the ability, if we're in our form of dread, to be able to use this because we'll have two attacks at level five. And then finally, you are immune to the Frightened Condition. And I really like this aspect of the Form of Dread because I don't want to play a character that induces fear into their enemies and then they themselves can also be frightened. Now, of course, if we're not in our Form of Dread, we can't be frightened. But if we then use the bonus action to activate our Form of Dread on our turn, the immunity to the Frightened Condition is going to cancel out whatever may have frightened us. So even though we can't be frightened it's only going to last around as long as we are still able to transform into our form of dread now we do get two uses of these this is based on our proficiency bonus again as a bonus action and then we get those refilled on a long rest Next, let's take a look at our spell selections for our level one character. Now, being a warlock, we're going to get access to two cantrips. So, of course, I'm going to take Eldritch Blast, but not just because it's really good. It's also going to combo with a lot of the other spells and abilities that we're going to get in later levels. This is one of the best cantrips in the game, and we're going to be able to select this because we are a warlock. It's going to have range up to 120 feet at level one, a plus five to hit, and it's going to do a, t a d 10 of force damage and at higher levels we get more beams or more attacks so at level five we'll get two attacks with it and that is going to progress on our overall level not just our class level so even though we'll be a warlock one sorcerer four at that point we'll still get that extra beam and then my second cantrip, I decided to go with another combat one, and this is going to be Toll the Dead. Now, this is going to allow the target to make a saving throw to take the damage, and I like to do that with my characters. I like to have one ranged spell attack and one saving throw attack, just dependent on the situation that I'm in. And Toll the Dead is one of the best. Now, as far as our first level spells are concerned, we get two of them. And the first one I picked is going to be around our theme, and that is to cause fear. So the spell is cause fear. You awaken the sense of mortality in one creature you can see within range. A construct or an undead is immune to this effect. The target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or become frightened of you until the spell ends. The frightened target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a success. And then we can also upcast this to hit more than one target. And this is going to be very ideal. This is going to be one of our combo pieces with our Hound of Ill Omen when we reach level seven and we get that ability. And this is going to be absolutely amazing. But until then, it's still going to be a very good spell to keep us safe and to set up our allies so that they can be able to take care of whoever has the fear condition. So really good spell and right into our theme. Now, I also have chosen Hex. Now, these are both concentration spells, so they will be dependent on our situation, whether we want to cause fear or whether we want to Hex a character. It's more either setting someone or something else up or being able to go for full damage. With Hex, we place a curse on a creature that you can see within range. Until the spell ends, you deal an extra D6 necrotic damage to the target whenever you hit it with an attack. Also, choose one ability when you cast this spell. The target has disadvantage on ability checks made with the chosen ability. And of course, we can move this around if that target hits zero or less hit points. So at level one, we can Hex as a bonus action and then cast our Eldritch Blast. And if we hit, we're we're going to do a d10 of force damage plus a d6 of necrotic damage. So Hex is very, very good, and it is going to be one of our mainstays. If we're looking just to do a lot of damage, casting Hex as a bonus action, and then Eldritch Blasting is probably going to be where we're at. So that's going to do it for us at level one. Let's multi-class into Sorcerer and begin our career in Shadow Magic. 
So here we are back on D&D Beyond with our level two character Onyx. Now we have taken one level in Warlock, the Undead Warlock, and that was to help with our armor class and hit points, some of the spells that we needed to have access to, and of course the Undead Warlock's ability to be able to frighten creatures and give ourselves immunity to the frightened condition. But now we're going to start our career in Shadow Magic, and as a Shadow Sorcerer level one, our first ability that we're going to get is Eyes of the Dark. Starting at first level we have dark vision with a range of 120 feet now as an asamar we already had dark vision to 60 feet so we're going to double that now with our eyes of the dark ability at level three this is going to give us the ability to cast the darkness spell and if we cast darkness using two sorcery points then we can see through that magical darkness with our eyes of the dark ability i've used this in combat a few times before and it's really handy although it is a little bit of a hindrance to our allies our second ability is Strengths of the Grave. Starting at first level, your existence in a twilight state between life and death makes you difficult to defeat. When damage reduces you to zero hit points, you can make a Charisma saving throw, which is going to be a DC 5 plus the damage taken. So if we've taken 10 damage and are reduced to zero hit points, that'll be a DC of 15. And on a success, you can instead drop to one hit point. You can't use this feature if you are reduced to zero hit points by radiant damage or a critical hit. And then after we succeed using the Strengths of the Grave ability, we can't use it again till we finish a long rest. So being hit by something and drop to zero hit points, we're going to have that chance to be able to stay alive, pop back up with one hit point. That's always one of my favorite abilities of Half Orcs, which has something similar, and it's it's really cool to see that on a shadow sorcerer one of one of my favorite abilities now when we multi-class into shadow sorcerer we get to pick four cantrips and three of them i'm just going to go with utility i feel very well set up with the eldritch blast and the toll the dead so three of these are going to be cantrips that are more utility which is going to be mage hand and as a shadow sorcerer i'd probably add a little bit of a shadow like appearance to my mage hand i think that would be really cool Message is another one. I absolutely love message for communication purposes and press the digitation just to do cool things. And we can probably just have like shadowy figures or something come out of our fingertips. I, I really like those. And I like this cantrip for its for your ability to be creative. Now, the fourth cantrip I picked is Mind Sliver. You drive a disorienting spike of psychic energy into the mind of one creature that you can see within range. The target must succeed on an intelligence saving throw or take a d6 of psychic damage and subtract a d4 from the next saving throw it makes before the end of your turn. Now, I really like Mind Sliver, and in fact, it's going to work very well with one of our meta magics, and we'll talk about that when we reach level three in Shadow Sorcerer. But this spell will be very important it'll give us a little trick that we can use in combat so i like it and we also get two first level spells and i decided to go with reactions to help protect us so the first one i picked was absorb elements as a reaction we can choose acid cold fire lightning or thunder and we can gain resistance and that means we'll only take half damage so for hit by a fire bolt or something like that we can take half damage from it the other one is shield, and that's where we create an invisible barrier of magical force around us. That's going to give us a plus five to our armor class until the beginning of our next turn. And I like that because we're only going to have an armor class of 14. So that's going to do it for us at level two. Let's level up Onyx to level three and take another level in Shadow Sorcerer. So here we are back on D&D Beyond with our level three character, Onyx. Onyx is a warlock level one and a sorcerer level two. Now, before we take a look at our second level sorcerer abilities, I want to jump back to being an Asamar. One of the reasons that I chose this race is for the Celestial Revelation. Now, this is an ability we get as a third level character, and it says as follows. When you reach third level, choose one of the revelation options below. Thereafter, you can use a bonus action to unleash the celestial energy within yourself, gaining the benefits of that revelation. Now your transformation lasts for one minute or until you end it as a bonus action. And we can do this once per day. So the revelation that I've chosen is Necrotic Shroud. Your eyes briefly become pools of darkness and ghostly flightless wings sprout from your back temporarily. Creatures other than your allies within 10 feet of you that can 
CU must succeed on a charisma saving throw or become frightened of you until the end of your next turn. Until the transformation ends, once on each of your turns, you can deal extra necrotic damage to one target when you deal damage to it with an attack or a spell. The extra damage equals your proficiency bonus. So now we have at least three different ways that we can cause fear and to instill the frightened condition on our enemies. And just as a reminder, the frightened condition means that a frightened creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear, us, is within line of sight. And also the creature can't willingly move closer to the source of fear. So we have our form of dread from being an undead warlock that gives us uh, the ability to cause fear. We now have our necrotic shroud from our awesome our race. And we also have the spell cause fear. So we have three very good sources to be able to try and put the frightened condition on our enemies. And not only that, but we can flavor this with our role playing and to describe what our character looks like when the Asmar sprouts those necrotic wings or when they take on a visage of the their patron lich or spirit or what have you using their form of dread or what does exactly happen when we cast a spell cause fear. So a lot of fun things to for our shadow magic sorcerer to be able to play this in a game. I absolutely love it. I'm having a lot of fun with this build. Now let's move on to our second level sorcerer abilities and the ability that we're going to get is called the Font of Magic. Now what Font of Magic does is it gives us two sorcery points that we can use for meta magic, which is enhancing some of our sorcerer spells, but we don't get meta magic until level three. So the other ability of Font of Magic is to be able to convert either spell slots into sorcery points or sorcery points into spell slots. So as a level two sorcerer, we can take those two sorcery points and get a first level spell slot back. And that's primarily the use of it at this level. Now, I do realize that there are some optimized character builds out there that are creating a warlock sorcerer that are referred to as sorlocks. Now, I don't know a lot about them, but I believe it is using the font of magic to be able to get multiple spell slots in crazy amounts. Now, that is something we are not going to explore today. As a character builder, I go more for theme and to create fun builds that are interesting and maybe doing something a little bit different as opposed to optimizing. So I will not be looking at Sorlock abilities or things like that, but I'm sure if that's something you're interested in, you can find that somewhere. Now, as a second level sorcerer, let's take a look at these spell slots. So speaking of which, you can see here that we have three first level spell slots. Now, these are sorcerer spell slots that we can regain after a long rest, and we have one packed spell slot and this is from our warlock level and we can cast this once and then once we finish a short rest we can get it back so we can use this one twice and of course we have two sorcery points so if we have expended one of our sorcerer spell slots we can use those two sorcery points to get that first level spell slot back so very handy and very resourceful now we do get to pick one more first level spell and I've chosen Featherfall. And I know Featherfall is a situational type of a spell and with a Warlock and a Sorcerer not getting much many spells to begin with, is this really an optimal choice? Well, let me present it to you the, the way I look at this because this is one of my favorite spells. I would rather have Featherfall available and never use it than to need Featherfall and not have it available to me. This spell has saved my butt dozens of times. I absolutely love it. So with Featherfall, we can use one reaction and we choose up to five fallen creatures within range. A fallen creature's rate of descent slows to 60 feet per round until the spell ends. If the creature lands before the spell ends, it takes no falling damage and can land on its feet and the spell ends for that creature. And I feel like my spells are pretty good at this point. I'm going to be relying a lot on Hex, Cause Fear, and my Eldritch Blast. I've already got my other reaction spells with Absorb Elements and Shield. And at third level, I'm pretty set. So having Feather Fall, just in case I need it, is really no big deal. And I'll probably be, I'll probably be glad I have it. So that is going to do it for our level three build. We're going to advance again in Sorcerer and pick up our Meta Magic. 
So here we are with Onyx, a level 4 character, Warlock level 1, and now a Sorcerer level 3. And at this level, we're going to get our Metamagic ability. And with Metamagic, we get to pick 2, and these are ways that Sorcerers can twist or enhance their spells. Now, remembering our Font of Magic that we previously discussed, we now get 3 Sorcery points from that, and we can use those Sorcery points to use our Metamagic. So the 2 that I chose... Let's look at this one first. The first one is going to be Subtle Spell. When you cast a spell, you can spend one sorcery point to cast it without any somatic or verbal components. And this is going to be fun. I'll show you why in just a second. The other meta magic that I chose is the Quicken Spell. When you cast a spell that has a casting time of one action, you can spend two sorcery points to change the casting time to one bonus action for this casting. Now, I do want to remind everyone of a rule that is buried in the player's handbook that you can't cast more than one leveled spell in a turn unless you have like the action surge from being a fighter you can only cast one cantrip and one leveled spell but with that in mind let's jump over to our spells and give a few examples so let's say that we want to quicken our cantrip mind sliver so we could can't we could quicken mind sliver and let's say that the target fails they're going to take a d6 of psychic damage and they're going to have to subtract a d4 from the next saving throw they make. Well, that was using our bonus action with Quicken. Now we come back with our first level spell of Cause Fear as our action. And this is a leveled spell. And now that character or that target has to subtract a d4 from the saving throw that they would make for Cause Fear. So a nice little one-two punch using our Quicken metamagic. Now, if we want to find some tricky ways for our subtle, we don't even have to be in combat. Again, using our cause fear, we could have this cast with our subtle meta magic. It only requires verbal components, so no one is going to be able to see us cast that. We don't have to move our hands around with any gestures. We don't have to speak any words. We can just use subtle magic, cause fear on a target at a local tavern and see what happens. So uh, I like both of these abilities, and I think they're going to work very well into our mysterious and into our fear type theme. Now, the other thing, and we previously discussed this, is we're also going to get the darkness spell. Now, this is part of being a shadow sorcerer at third level. And again, we can cast this using one of our second level spell slots, but we can also cast this using two sorcery points. And if we do that, then we can see through that magical darkness. And that is a nice little trick to have in the bag. And Looking at our spell slots, we have four first level spell slots from our sorcerer and one packed slot from our warlock. And we now have two second level spell slots from being a sorcerer. And the second level sorcerer spell that I chose is mirror image. And I would probably have us all looking very shadowy as part of the the images or the duplicates we get from mirror image. This is a very good defensive spell that should keep us safe. It's, it's one of my favorites. So that's all I have for us at level four. Let's advance up to a sorcerer level four, get our first feet and see what's next in store. So here we are with our level five character, Onyx. Onyx is a level one warlock and a level four sorcerer. Now that fourth level sorcerer is going to get us our feet and I have chosen my favorite feat and perhaps one of the best in the game and that is Fate Touched. So Fate Touched is what they call a half feat. So we do get a put we do get to put a plus one modifier into our charisma. So you can see there, we now have a plus four modifier or an 18 charisma, which is going to increase our charisma base abilities, saving throws, and our attacks with Eldritch Blast. So that's fantastic. But not only that, we get the Misty Step spell and we can cast Misty Step once per day without using a spell slot. But to top everything off, we get an additional first level spell that's from the Divination or Enchantment School Magic, and I have chosen Silvery Barbs. Now, Silvery Barbs is an excellent spell. There's a lot of folks that talk about it as a reaction. We can have a creature within 60 feet of us that has rolled a d20. We can make them re-roll that d20, and they have to use the lower roll. And again, that's as a reaction when someone is trying to make an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw. And this works very well for us too. If we cast a, a cause fear and they make the saving throw, we can use our own reaction or we can use our reaction on our own turn 
to cast Silvery Barbs and make them re-roll that if we really need that spell to go through. So Silvery Barbs, one of the best in the game. Misty Step, one of the best in the game. And we get two or a free casting of each of those once per day. And we can also use our leveled spell slots to cast them. Now, the second level spell that I have chosen at this level is Maximilian's Earthen Grasp. So this one is going to be very interesting when we get our Hound of Ill Omen. But until then, it's also going to work very much in the same vein that we talked about earlier with our Quicken spell. We can Quicken our Mind Sliver Cantra. And then we can use our main action to cast Earth and Grasp in hopes of making sure that they fail that saving throw. So with this spell, this is an action that re does require our concentration. You choose a five foot square unoccupied space on the ground that you can see within range. A medium hand made from compacted soil rises there and reaches for one creature that you can see within five feet of it. And of course, my Earth and Hand is going to be shrouded with shadows and stuff like that. The target must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, the target's going to take 2d6 of bludgeoning damage and is restrained for the spell's duration. And let's look at restrain. A restrained creature's speed becomes zero and it can't benefit from any bonus to its speed. Attack rolls against the creature have advantage and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. The creature has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. Now, why this is important is because we are going to get Fireball eventually, and that is a Dexterity saving throw. But even more important is on this level, attack rolls against it have advantage. So if we look over at our main attack, which is our Eldritch Blast, now that we are level 5, we get two beams, or we get two attacks. So if we have someone in our Earthen Graphs, Having that concentration so that it's holding them there, we can use our action on subsequent turns to use two Eldritch Blasts, and those are going to be rolled with advantage. So a fantastic little combination there with Maximilian's Earthen Grasp. Now, you could also use an action to have the hand continually crush a restrained target and they need to make a strength saving throw and of course if they fail that they'll take the full damage if they make it they only take half but we're not even going to worry about that we just want to get that initial restrained where we're holding them there and then all the attacks against them are going to have advantage so our eldritch blast is probably most likely going to hit a very good spell and again we'll come back to this one when we get our hound of ill omen because it works very well with it also as well now, as a level 5 character, our proficiency bonus is now at a plus 3, which is very nice for us. It adjusts and makes our saving throws better, our skills better, and going right back to our cantrips one more time, looking at our Eldritch Blast, we now have a plus 7 to hit, and that's going to do a d10 of damage. So that's going to do it for us at this level. Let's advance up to a level 6 character and a sorcerer level 5. So here we are with our 6th level character Onyx, and we are going to advance to Sorcerer level 5. Now, we are building a fear-themed character. So you would think that it would be obvious that at this level we would choose our 3rd level spell as fear. So for those of you unfamiliar, fear is a 3rd level spell that requires an action. You project a phantasmal image of a creature's worst fears. Each creature in a 30-foot cone must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or drop whatever it is that they are holding and become frightened for the duration. While frightened by the spell, a creature can, must take the dash action and move away from you by the safest available route on each of its turns, unless there is nowhere to move. If the creature ends its turn at a location where it doesn't have line of sight of you, then the creature can make a wisdom saving throw, and on a success, that spell ends for that creature. So selecting fear for our fear-based character should be automatic, right? Well, not exactly. In fact, I'm not going to select this. So I have played this character before, and I found... By playing this character, I did this at level 7 with fear as a third level spell. I had too many fear effects. I had way too much of it, and it just was way too redundant. So looking at rebuilding this character and doing it in a different way, 
this spell actually is not going to make our list. And one of the reasons is that 30 foot cone is going to hit allies as well as enemies. So we don't want to cause fear amongst our allies. And the second thing is, is this makes a creature move away from us and keep moving away from us. And what we want to do with our character is we just want to get them that frightened condition. And again, for those of you that need the reminder, I think I need it myself. The frightened condition means that a creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, while the source of its fear is within the light of sight and the creature can't willingly move closer to that source of fear. So the disadvantage on attack rolls. So what we want to do with our fear is we want to ensure that the rest of our party is going to be safe. So our fighters and our paladins that are in melee combat, they're going to be able to be up there fighting and whoever they're fighting against is going to have that disadvantage. And when we get to our Hound of Vill Omen, it'll be the same way that whatever is attacking our Hound is going to have disadvantage because they are frightened. And that's the way that we're going to use it. And we're going to use our Maximilian's Earth and Grass to hold them in place. So we don't want them running away. We don't want to affect our allies. So unfortunately, we're not going to choose fear for our fear build. So let me know what you think of that in the comment section below. But again, I played this character as level seven and this was a wasted spell slot for me. But what wasn't a wasted spell slot was Fireball. So for those of you not familiar, and I can't believe that you wouldn't be, but Fireball is a spell that is going to cause 8d6 fire damage within a 20 foot radius sphere. And of course, half as much on a successful dexterity saving throw. One of the most powerful spells in the book. And, and honestly, we needed just a little bit of of firepower and fireball is going to give it to us. So those that is the spell that I'm going to choose at this level. Now there are a few other things that's going to happen for Onyx at this level and one of the abilities, this is a sorcerer ability that is brand new from Tasha's Galdron of Everything that's going to be called Magical Guidance. You can tap into your inner wellspring of magic to try to conjure success from failure. When you make an ability check that fails, you can spend one sorcery point to reroll the d20. You must use a new roll, potentially turning the failure into a success. Now. As far as our sorcery points are concerned, our font of magic is giving us five at this level. So we have five sorcery points. So magical guidance, let's say we are trying to hop across an acid pit and we're using an acrobatics check and we fail. Spending that one sorcery point to try to succeed on that acrobatics check is going to be very, very good for us. So a fantastic ability and I'm glad to see that the sorcerer has it. So that is going to do it for us at this level. Be sure to leave a comment below and let, let me know what you think about me not selecting fear as a third level spell for a fear build. I'm, I'm anxious to see what your thoughts are, whether you agree with me that we already have too many fear based spells and abilities, or if you think that there's a better way to use it. So let's move on to our next level and finally get our Hound of Ill Omen. So here we are back on D&D Beyond with our level seven character. And now we get our Hound of Ill Omen because we are a shadow magic sorcerer level six. Now this is one of my favorite parts about being a shadow sorcerer, getting our hound. And I'm going to name my Hound of Ill Omen Macbeth. So we have Onyx with his Hound of Ill Omen Macbeth. And if you know the sources where I'm getting this at, leave a comment below and uh, let me know that you figured out where I got these names from because that's a lot of fun. So at sixth level, you gain the ability to call forth a howling creature of darkness to harass your foes. As a bonus action, you can spend three sorcery points to magically summon a Hound of Ill Omen to target one creature that you can see within 120 feet of you. The Hound uses the Dire Wolf statistics with the following changes. It's going to be size medium, and it's going to be a monstrosity, not a beast. It appears with a number of temporary hit points equal to half our sorcerer level, so it'll have three temporary hit points in addition to the hit points it would get using the Dire Wolf statistics. It can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain. The Hound will take five force damage if it ends its turn within an object. And at the start of its turn, the Hound automatically knows its target's location. If the target was hidden, it is no longer hidden from the Hound. Now, let's get to the important part of the Hound of Ill Omen. 
The hound appears in an unoccupied space of your choice within 30 feet of the target. Roll initiative for the hound. On its turn, it can only move towards the target by the most direct route, and it can use its action only to attack the target. The hound can make opportunity attacks, but only against that target. Additionally, here's the important part finally, while the hound is within five feet of that target, the target has disadvantage on saving throws against any spell you cast. The hound will disappear if it hits zero hit points. So our hound of ill omen summoned as a bonus action. And we want to use this for the big bad. We want to, we, we've get one shot and I don't believe there's anything against us having two hounds of ill omen. I don't see that. So we could have two Macbeths if we want. We do have six sorcery points at this level, but I would probably just concentrate on the one. We'll use the three sorcery points and we'll send it at the target, the, the big bad, the main one, the one that's going to have a lot of hit points, the one that we're going to need to bring down, so to speak. Now, it's going to have disadvantage on saving throws against any spell that we cast. So in our first turn, we can bring out our Hound of El Omen, and then we can go back and look at our spells. We could strategically put a fireball so it doesn't hit our Hound, but it's like right behind there. So maybe the radius just hits the target, and that would be disadvantage on that dexterity saving throw for that. Don't forget we have Maximilian's Earthen Grasp. So on our... Next turn, we could use Maximilians to be able to make them have disadvantage on that strength saving throw. And of course, we have cause fear. So having our Hound of Ill Omen in melee combat with our target is going to give them disadvantage on the wisdom saving throw, which at this point is a wisdom DC 15 that they would need to make for our cause fear ability. And if they do become frightened because of this, again, going back to our frightened, they'll have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while we are within their sight. So they'll be in melee combat with our Hound of Ill Omen. They'll have disadvantage on attacks against our Hound of Ill Omen. And of course, they can keep making saving throws to try to end this effect. But with the Hound of Ill Omen being there, they're going to have disadvantage on those saving throws to try to end this effect. So what we're doing here is we're setting up our Hound of Ill Omen to just chomp on whatever target that we see fit. And then once we get this going, let's say we have concentration held on this cause fear, our Hound of Ill Omens out there, we're going to be sitting back with our Eldritch Blast, just sitting in two blasts per turn and this sorcerer build at level seven is very very powerful it's going to do a lot of damage and it's just going to be a lot of fun to play so that's going to do it for our level seven character we are now sorcerer six we have our hound of ill omen we're going to use it to our full advantage we're causing all of this fear we have this mystical shadowness about us we are badass but we're going to add to that when we advance to level eight because we're going to take our second level of warlock so here we are with Onyx. Onyx is now a level 8 character and we're taking our second level in Warlock. And I did this because I wanted to get the Eldritch Invocations. So if you're not familiar with those, that is a Warlock ability you get at level 2 where you get to pick from a list of effects. And the main one that I wanted was the Agonizing Blast, which means that when we catch cast Eldritch Blast, we get to add our Charisma modifier to the damage that it deals on a hit. So looking over at our cantrips, Eldritch Blast, we have a plus seven to hit. We get two beams because we're level five. And now we have a D10 plus four on the damage. And don't forget that we'll also get that extra little bit of necrotic damage if we decide to cast our first level spell haste. We also get some extra damage from uh, some of our racial and class abilities and things of that nature. So we should be able to deal out some serious damage with Eldritch Blast and Agonizing Blast adds to that. Now I had a hard time trying to decide what I wanted my second invocation to be. I did end up going with Eldritch Mine. You have advantage on constitution saving throws that you make to maintain concentration on the spell. As of this level, we do have quite a few that do require concentration, such as Cause Fear and Hex and Protection from Evil and Good, which I'll discuss in a minute. Maximilian's Earth and Grasp, that's another one. So I felt this would come in handy. Not only that, but when I get fourth level Sorcerer spells, I'm probably going to select a few that also require concentration. 
But now let's take a look at our spells because we do get to pick another first level warlock spell. And it was very hard for me to pick between Bane and Protection from Evil and Good because I feel like Bane would work really good with our Hound of Ill Omen. But I wanted to jump back to that fear theme. And so I took Protection from Evil and Good. So what this does, until the spell ends, one willing creature you touch is protected against certain types of creatures, aberrations, celestials, elementals, phase, fiends, and undead. The protection grants several benefits. Creatures of those types have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target, and the target cannot be charmed, frightened, or possessed by them. Now, if the target is already charmed, or possessed by them, charm, frighten, or possess, then they have advantage on any new saving throw against the relevant effect. And when I read this, I recall a moment in a game where one of my allies was charmed by a vampire and they were hunting me down and it was absolutely terrifying. So I'm hoping that that never happens again because I'll have protection from evil and good, hopefully enough to trigger something so they can maybe try to get out of the charm effect and hopefully this spell will help them. And I think going into a situation, if we're going into, if we know the big bad's coming up and it's some type of a vampire, you know, Curse of Strahd, for example, or some type of evil spirit, then we can slap this protection from evil and good on whoever we don't want turned against us or running away with fear. So our barbarian, our, our big melee combat person. So I think the spell will come in handy. And now we've got this Eldritch Invocation that'll help us make saving throws constitution, saving throws, or at least make them with advantage so that we can maintain concentration on this. So very good spell here. Now I did forget to mention as well, the last level that we advanced to for Sorcerer, we got to pick another third level spell, and I decided to go against a concentration type spell. It was between Tongues, Dispel Magic, and Counterspell, and I ended up going with Counterspell. I think it would be very good. It's it's not a spell that I'm relying on. It, it, fall, it falls very much into the same thing that Feather, Featherfall does. I would rather have Featherfall and not use it than to not have Featherfall and need it, and the same here with Counterspell. So those are the spells that I have chosen. We are a level eight character. Let's do a few more levels. Now, this is a point where I needed to choose how I wanted to continue with this character, and perhaps you can leave a comment below and let me know what you would do, but I was looking at taking more levels of Warlock to get the Pact of the Tome, where we get a Book of Shadows, which seems to really fall into theme with our character. If we are a Shadow Sorcerer, having the Book of Shadows going to that third level Warlock would seem to be the logical choice, but I actually am going to go a couple more sorcerer levels before I do. I want to get sorcerer eight so I can get some fourth level spells and take advantage of them. But let me know in the comments below what direction you would take. And I do want to point this out. If we were to continue to warlock, let's say let's have a level six warlock, level six sorcerer, we would get the graved touch feature, which would make it so that we don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. And in addition, once during each of our turns, when we hit a creature with an attack roll and roll damage against the creature, we can replace that damage with necrotic damage. So Eldritch Blast could be necrotic damage. And then when if we are in our form of dread, we can roll an additional damage type and use that as necrotic damage. So if we wanted to go more, keep going in the blaster direction with those Eldritch Blasts, then we would probably take our Warlock up to level six. But I'm going to decide against that. We're going to advance Onyx up to level nine and take another level in Sorcerer. So here we are back on D&D Beyond with our Sorlock Onyx. He is an Asimar level 10 character, Warlock level 2, Sorcerer level 8. Now I decided to combine levels 9 and 10 because I'm basically going to be choosing an ability score improvement and a few spells. So let's do that first. As a level 10 character, we hit Sorcerer level 8, able to choose either a feat or an ability score improvement, and I wanted to get my charisma up. So I went with the ability score improvement, put two points into charisma, and maxed that out at 20. That is a plus five that is going to affect our saving throws and a lot of our skills and of course our spells in particular that is going to give our spell save dcs a 17 making them a lot harder and our eldritch blasts are going to be a plus nine to hit and that is going to hit for a d10 plus five of damage so i felt it was very important to get our charisma up there we now have a proficiency of plus four we have 65 hit points we have a armor class of 14 still, but our character is really coming together, and this is a very solid level for him. Now, I did choose two 
fourth level spells. The first one that I chose is Blight. And this is one that does not require concentration. And I want to use this with my Hound of Ill Omen. As a reminder, the Hound of Ill Omen is going to give whatever it is targeting disadvantage on saving throws against my spells. So with that in mind, we cast Blight and Necromantic Energy washes over a creature of your choice that you can see within range, draining moisture and vitality from it. The target must make a constitution saving throw. The target takes 8d8 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. The spell has no effect on undead or constructs. Now, if you target a plant creature or a magical plant, it makes a saving throw with disadvantage. Now, again, we already have our Hound of El Omen looking at this big bad scenario or this main threat, if you will. Our Hound of El Omen is right up in their face and then they are probably going to fail this saving throw and take that 8d8 of ne necrotic damage. And if we want to ensure that they do, we've got our silvery barbs and we also have our little trick with casting our cantrip the uh, Mind Sliver, quickening that, and then following it up with Blight. So that is going to be a really good damage dealing spell. It's a lot better than Fireball because they were only going to target that one person and keep everybody else out of harm's way. Now I did look at a few other fourth level spells that would require concentration and would benefit from the disadvantage that the Hound of Ill Omen provides, but those were Polymorph and Banishment, and Polymorph I wasn't fond of because the Hound is going to be doing damage to them and they would just revert back, but Banishment was very interesting, but if they do get banished, then my Hound of Ill Omen is done. It's not causing any more damage. So in the end, I decided to go with Greater Invisibility. Now this does require concentration, but if I'm at a point that I'm not worried about my Hound of Ill Omen, I just want to become invisible and Eldritch Blast all day or throw out my spells, then I would probably do this. Greater Invisibility, you become invisible or a creature you touch becomes invisible till the spell ends. Now, while we're doing this, we can cast spells without being revealed. So this is a fantastic and very powerful spell. So that is my level 10 character Onyx. He is a Warlock level 2, Sorcerer level 8, and let me know in the comment section below, would you put any more levels into Warlock? Should we stay on theme with our shadows and pick the pack of the tome and advance a few levels, get up to maybe balance it out where we have a level 6 Warlock and get some of those really cool and interesting undead warlock abilities or would you keep going through sorcerer i believe at sorcerer 14 we get the ability to jump through the shadows and do some types of teleportation or things of that nature but i'm really liking this character i think some of the best and my favorite levels to play this character are going to be levels 2 4 7 and 10. So let me know in the in the comments below. Do you like this build? What did you think about it? And if you'd like to see this character sheet at level 10, you can check out my website, wallydm.com. I'll put a link in the description below. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this character build and let me know if there's any future builds that you'd like to see from me in the future. Thank you very much for watching and on to the next.